Uh, let's turn over to James chapter 5 this morning. We're going to look at a few different principles found in James chapter 5. There's a lot in there. There's a lot in this great little book. But I really just want to look at three important lessons for us. And let's pray one more time as we get into the Word. Father, we do thank You for Your goodness to us. Thank You that You call us Your children because You've saved us and therefore we are Your own. We're so grateful for the work that You not only have done, the work that You're doing in us now, but the work that You have planned for us. And then, Lord, that we get to do that. We get to spend eternity with You. Lord, uh, we long for that. But Lord, even as we were just reminded that we know there's a lot of people that as of now won't be joining us. And so, Lord, we'll stick it out as long as you need us here to do that work. Please pour out your grace upon us. Lord, please pour out your grace upon us now. Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear what you want to say as we settle our hearts in and look at your word. Please speak. And may we hear in Jesus' name. Amen. So James chapter 5, lots of great lessons here. Again, I just would like to look at three of them. And the first one we're going to see is found in verses 7 and 8. So let's just read those two verses and, and see what we can pick up here from that. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. The first important principle I think we're going to look at today is that of patience. And not just patience, but it says specifically the patience, or he describes specifically the patience of a farmer. If you're anything like me, when you first got saved, one of the, the things that you started putting on your prayer list was for patience, right? You know, that great wise prayer that we all prayed, Lord, give me patience. Amen. And then the next day, mysteriously, these events come along that really try our patience. And you probably thought that, you know, you're relatively patient. And then for those of you that are married, you get married and you think, she's not patient. No, you think, Lord, I'm not, I'm so impatient. What's wrong with me? And then you start having kids and you think patience is anything but a description of my life. I mean, I used to think I was a fairly patient person, but then, I don't know if this describes any of you, throw in a dog, right? Because that makes sense, you know, and we, when we get dogs, we've had a couple of dogs, and our most recent addition to the family, Lola, we got her when she was a puppy. And if you want to learn something about patience, here's your Go, go be blessed and go get a puppy today. And like, I'm not patient enough. Ooh, have a puppy. And just see what, we're generally, spe generally speaking, we're not very patient people. But we're encouraged to be. Listen to this again. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. And notice that second part. For the coming of the Lord. See, there's, there's just like the farmer where he's waiting for the precious fruit of the earth, there's something for us to be patient about as well, and that's the coming of the Lord. And we'll talk about that more in a second, but again, look at how, how James brings this out. He says, see how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. Now, I grew up about 15 minutes from the beach in California. I grew up in Southern California. My family that immigrated to the United States immigrated to Massachusetts. In fact, we were just up in that area this weekend. And I still have family members up there that are, are lobster fishermen. Farming, I just don't think it has any part of our DNA. It's just we can't relate to farming. The ocean, fine. Farming, not so much. But in James's day, people really got it. It was a normal part of their life. It's interesting to me that James talks about farming and the patience of a farmer, but the Apostle Paul in 2 Timothy chapter 2 also discusses the farmer, and he talks about the hardworking farmer. It's interesting to me about that because he compares the hardworking farmer to that of the athlete and that of the soldier. And if there's anything that these have in common, of course there's the patience, but there's a sense of loyalty as in a farmer, an athlete, and a soldier, 
they cannot quit. They can't give up. They can't throw in the towel. They know they need to keep on going. If there's one other thing that marks them, it's that of a a real seriousness about their work. In other words, there's no level of laziness in any of those three men's lives. Think about it. Think about a lazy athlete. If you've ever done any kind of sports and you're lazy about it, guess what that means? You're sitting on the bench. A lazy athlete gets no game time. A lazy farmer, his family starves to death. A lazy soldier, either he or himself, or I'm sorry, himself or his comrades, get killed. There's just no room for it. And now take that and apply that to our Christian lives. And oh, how important that we have that serious commitment to what the Lord set before us. He wants us to be like this farmer, a farmer that's steadfast, he's patient. And again, notice this, until the coming of the Lord that he says there in verse 7, and then at the end of verse 8, you also be patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. The farmer knows, he knows, and that's something we're going to look at with all three of the the lessons we're going to learn today. He knows something, and what he knows is that his hard work will pay off. There will be a, a fruit, a harvest that comes from his work. Paul would say this in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 9. Let's not get tired of doing what is good. At just the right time, we will reap a harvest of blessing if we don't give up. We have to have that same mindset. Lord, this is difficult. I need to be patient because we also need to know something There's an end in store. The work that we're putting into, notice it this way, the work we're putting into our Christianity will pay off. The prayers that, you know, these guys talked about the prayer cards for the Harvest America event. I can personally say that I received the Lord Jesus through the ministry of Greg Laurie. I listened to his preaching. I got saved. I would say that that hard work and that patience of putting those names on that list, really, really, and praying for them, be patient. The Lord will do what He wants to do, but we need to have that patience. And not just patience, the patience of a farmer. A few months ago, we had the privilege of visiting uh, another Calvary Chapel in southern Hungary. And this church has been there since 1991. 21 years this fellowship's been there. It's seen a lot of missionaries that come and go. And now the pastor of that church, he's a Hungarian man. He's a great, hardworking man, loves Jesus loves his family, loves his church family, loves the Word of God. Great man. And he's able to be patient knowing that those 21 years of work that have gone before him, the sowing, the planting, the watering, there's going to be a a produce that comes from that. The people in that church, they're going to be growing in the things of the Lord. There will be fruit. And so he's able to patiently continue moving on with what he's been set forth to do. So a good farmer needs to be steadfast, he needs to be patient, he needs to have confidence. And may I really encourage you that the work that you're doing, there'll be a fruit, a harvest, a, a reward for that. There will be something that comes from it. But we need to have that confidence. That's actually the case. That's the truth. We need to know what the farmer knows. We need to keep going. That brings us to our second point, and we're going to find this in verses 9 through 11. Second point is that of endurance. James says, do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering and patience. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have seen or you've heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Endurance or perseverance and more specifically, I think we're to have the endurance that Job had. I ask this every time I I teach, but I'm not sure if I'm allowed to give homework. If I could give homework, I would encourage you to read through the book of Job, and you're going to find out that if this man was anything, he was a man that was not only patient, but he was a man who had endurance, who was able to persevere. Obviously, he went through great physical suffering, and it's one thing, you know, to visit. This It's been two and a half years since we've been here, and I don't really know how everyone's doing. But I would imagine there's many of you here today that are suffering something physically. You've got some sort of hardship physically in your life. I wonder if you're anything like Job, if you have some family-related situations going on in your life. He did. 
But Job also had, who will label friends, but when you read through Job, you realize they're not the greatest friends in the whole world. And of course, Job's ever-loving wife, you know, the great statement that she made to him, oh, Job, just curse God and die. <laughs> oh, thank you, sweetheart. Thank you for looking out for me. I'm going to put that on the refrigerator, you know, just curse God and die. Thank you, sweetie, for your, your love for me. But this, this man, Job, you know, he had people in his life that just did not understand him. They didn't understand his situation. And I wonder if you guys do too. I wonder if you have family, you have friends that are looking at you thinking, really? Jesus? You're following Jesus? I just don't get that. I know at our school we have a lot of people like that. Um, over the years we've had, I just wrote down a, a handful of different places that people have come from, but we've had students from Australia, New Zealand, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Kenya, India. We have Pakistani students at our school right now. It's remarkable to me. I still don't know how they found us other than Google. Um, China, Japan, Brazil, Korea. We have a st or had a student family from South Africa. We've had students from Russia, obviously Hungary, England, Ireland, all across Europe, all across the United States. I mean, literally from Alaska to Hawaii to Texas, California, Maine, Florida, all over the place. And right now, this is another one to kind of get your head around this, we have a Cuban refugee at our school. Because that makes perfect sense. You know, American international school in Hungary, Cuban refugee. I, I don't know either. His name's Pablo. You could pray for him. Great, great brother. But I'll tell you, a lot of these students endure great misunderstanding from their families, as you can imagine. You know, the students that, that come to us from Korea, their families might have some idea about what they're doing, but they might not really encourage them to move forward. You're going to go to a different country to follow Jesus? I mean, think about our, our students from India. Their families just don't understand what they're doing nor why they're doing it. In fact, one of the greatest kind of sets of misunderstandings would be for our students in Europe. Their families just don't understand what they're doing or why they're doing it. And I wonder... I wonder how many of them, you know, just need to just continue on. They need to keep moving. They need to have the endurance that Job had, who went through great misunderstanding. But again, listen to verse 11 here. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. And you've heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Job endured, and what we see for him was that the, the end of it all was, was that of, of blessing. Not just that, oh, he got it all back, but that he knew no matter what, I want to bring glory to God. I want to see God glorified in my whole life. In Job chapter 1, we, we find him saying, naked I came into this world, and naked I'll depart. The Lord gave me what I had, and the Lord took it away. And then, of course, Job finishes it and says, blessed be the name of the Lord. I think Job was very similar to that of John the Baptist, another greatly misunderstood individual. I mean, think about John. Hmm, I'm going to move to the wilderness. Did he do it this way? I'm going to move to the wilderness so that I can eat grasshoppers. Or did he say, wow, the Lord wants me to go to the wilderness and, hmm, getting pretty hungry. Those locusts are starting to look pretty good. I've got to eat something, a diet of locusts. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. He was willing to do it. If you're taking notes today, I, I would encourage you to write this down. It's something that I think that not only Job, but John the Baptist and so many of the great heroes of the Bible learned. But they learned this. This life is not about this life. Very simple. But it's hard to get our heads around when there's all these pressures of the world and friends and family. Oh, you need to stop doing that. Why would you do that? Why would you? I mean, you go to church every Sunday? Really? I mean, Easter and Christmas, that's enough, right? Oh, no. I, wait, you go on Wednesday nights as well? That's crazy. Well, we know that this life is not about this life. John the Baptist, if the Lord needs me to out in the wilderness, and thank you, Lord, for supplying food <laughs> of some variety, food there. I'll, I'll eat it. Job, if this is, Lord, what you have for me right now, I am willing to endure because I know 
This life's not about this life. There's more to it than this. Listen to what Job said in chapter 19 of his book. As for me, I know that my Redeemer lives. Again, same thing. The farmer knows that there will be a harvest from his work. He knows that his patient labor will pay off. Job says, I know that my Redeemer lives. He knows there's more to this life. And he said, he will stand upon the earth at last. And after my body has decayed, yet in my body I shall see God. I will see him for myself. Yes, I will see him with my own eyes. Oh, how my heart yearns within me. Job was able to endure because by faith, he saw the end. He saw that there was more to it. And I want to spend a couple minutes on this idea of endurance before we move on and look at our third point this morning. But just kind of, what is endurance? Well, the Greek, it's actually a very simple word. And it basically means just to remain or to stay. And just as the farmer is patient and doesn't quit, so we too are to endure. We're not to turn away. we got to keep on going. I like how someone described endurance. They said, endurance is a long obedience in the same direction. And I love it, you know, as I talked about visiting that other Calvary in, in southern Hungary a few months ago. Um, I love to be able to go to different Calvaries and just see how this works. You know, some years ago, when I was just getting started in the ministry, I was invited to, to visit this particular church's um, the pastor there, he asked me, hey, do you want to go to our board meeting? We're having a board meeting and just, you know, you can come and just listen and check out what we're doing here. Oh, that sounds great. Thank you. So at this particular church, the, one of the board members kind of raised his hand and, you know, pastor, I'm just wondering if you can tell me what our five-year vision is for the church. And as a young guy getting started in ministry, I thought, oh, that's a great question. And the pastor said, that's a great question. And, and here's our answer. Our, our five-year vision for the church Teach the Word of God. Oh, um, well, okay, that's great, but I mean, what's your plan here? Oh, well, we plan on teaching verse by verse through the Bible. Okay, but I mean, you know, your vision, what about any programs? Do you have programs you want to do for the church? Oh, yeah, we have programs. We want to have a youth ministry where we take our young people and go verse by verse through the Bible. Oh, okay, well, what about the children's ministry? Do Mm -hmm. We've got a great program intended for them. We want to bring them to the Sunday school classrooms and teach them the Bible verse by verse. And, you know, this other board member is just kind of, that's not really what I meant, but I hope he got it. And it was great to say, no, we're going to have a long obedience in the same direction. This is it. I mean, this, is, this book gives us all things we need for life and godliness. Let's endure in it. Let's keep going in it. Let's be true to it. And let's be honest, there's sometimes, there's some things in it that are hard to understand. This is really encouraging to me, and we might talk about this more later on, but Peter, in one of his letters, he's describing Paul's letters, and he says that Paul's letters, like the rest of Scripture, he's therefore calling Paul's letters, Romans, etc., etc., Scripture, they're the Word of God. And Peter, you know, this is Peter that all jokes about heaven involve Peter, you know, at the pearly gates and everything. This is Peter also an author of part of the Bible, and he says of Paul's words, of which are some things hard to understand. I don't know about you, but I'm really encouraged by that. This is Peter that's listening to, that's reading Paul and says, I don't, I don't understand all that. Oh, thank you for saying that, Peter, because I don't get it either. But I know it's good for me. I know I need to keep going. I know I need to learn to apply these principles to my life. This one in particular, endurance, oh man, I need that. I need to keep going with it. You know, one of the things of endurance is kind of a misconception is that endurance means you never get tired. And I disagree with that. I say it like this. I believe that endurance is to being tired as courage is to having fear. In other words, endurance means although I'm tired, I'm going to keep going. Courage isn't, I'm not afraid, therefore I move ahead. Courage is, I'm really, really scared, but I'm going to go anyway. We call those people heroes. You know, you don't say, hey, I went to the grocery store today. Whoa, courage. 
You're my hero. You went, maybe some of you men are like, wait, you went to the grocery store with your wife today? Wow, you, you actually are my hero. But that's, that's another story altogether. But courage means that although there is fear, I will go ahead. Endurance means although I'm tired, think about someone running a marathon. We've got the Olympics coming up. All these athletes running, training, all this hard work. They know that in order to cross the finish line, in order to receive a prize, an award, I need to fight through that sense of being tired. One of the other parts of this is that we need to be careful that we don't get tired of something. May we never get tired of God's living word. May, even if you find yourself in a difficult section of Scripture that you just, you're not really sure what it's about, keep going anyways. Keep moving forward. Stay in the Word of God. We're going to be tired along the way, but like Job, we need to maintain that work. We need to press forward. So the endurance of Job. The third thing that James has for us, and the final point today, is really, I'm going to say it like this, it's the simplest of them all, and therefore the most difficult. Prayer. Listen to what he says, and let's read verses 13 down to 18. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing psalms. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Verse 15, And the prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And note verse 17 here. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the earth gave rain, and the earth produced its fruit. I like that. Okay, so, got it, Jeremy. You're talking about having patience of a farmer. Okay, I'm with you with that, and we can try that. The endurance of Job, uh, pushing it there a little bit, but... Praying, okay, yeah, that actually is tough, but what James is describing for us isn't just praying. I think he's encouraging us to have the prayer life of Elijah. Endurance of Job, really? Prayer life of Elijah? And this is where most of us just kind of throw up our hands and say, yeah, that, that's great, that sounds nice, but I'm not Elijah. That's the one problem here. And we have this tendency to think the great heroes of the Bible the great heroes of the faith through church history, we think this. Of course they did great things. They're great people. But I'm just me. Therefore, mm, I don't really think my life is going to amount to much, so why should I really try? But Elijah, oh no, he's great. Right? What if I say it this way? Is it possible that, oh, wait, let's notice it again. Let's see what the Bible says. Verse 17 Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Is it possible that we remember the great heroes of the faith for doing great things? Is it possible that we think they were great, therefore they did great things, when they're people with a nature just like us? And they attempted great things for God? And God did great things through them? Is it possible that we've kind of got it a little bit backwards? But this is where we all say, yeah, but this is Elijah. <laughs> this is the super prophet Elijah. You know, Moses and Elijah, the, the epitome of the law and the prophets. Elijah. Yeah, yeah, that Elijah. Is it possible, and I think about this sometimes, is it, is it possible when we get to heaven that, you know, we're going to see different people there are we going to look at Hosea and go, oh, hey, nice to meet you? And Hosea's going to say, did you read my book? And we're going to say, um, yeah, I was really busy that 10-year period of time. I never, there's only 66 books in the Bible. You can, I didn't, I don't want to talk to you anymore, Hosea. And we're going to walk around and meet these different people. And it's just, that's uncomfortable. I don't want, and is it possible we're going to be in heaven and we're going, whoa, do you see who that is over there? Who is it? It's Elijah. No way. And then we're going to be nudging one another. Go get his autograph. Like, are we going to ask for autographs in heaven? I don't, theologically, I don't think that works, but are we going to, be, are we going to think that way, you know? Well, oh, there's Jeremiah, there's Elijah. Of course, they're hanging out. You know, why wouldn't they? They're these great prophets. Consider this. Is it possible they're going to look at us and say, whoa, do you see who those people are? That's the church. 
that's the group of people that we were prophesying about through those years of our ministry. We were prophesying about the nation of Israel and about the church. That God was going to pour out His blessing on the Gentiles as well. Whoa. And there they are. That group of people that God wanted to pour His Holy Spirit upon all of them simultaneously. I wonder if they're going to ask us for autographs. You see, because Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And notice what it says there in verse 17. He was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed. Him being but a man said, I need to pray. And God being God heard this man's prayers and answered them. I think we need to kind of get our heads around the, just the simplicity of this thing that we need to, we're men and women just like Elijah. We're just people. Well, we know Jesus. Let's be praying. Let's talk to the Lord. And notice how he prays, of course. He prayed earnestly. He had this diligent prayer life. Prayer life. That's an interesting concept. Again, if you're taking notes, please jot this down. One of the keys to a great and successful prayer life, one of the keys to a great and successful prayer life is to have a prayer life. We laugh because I can relate to that, but my prayers, I don't know about you, but my prayers go unanswered when I don't bother praying them. I'm not really hearing from the Lord. Are you talking to Him? No. 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 Are you finding prayers being answered? No. Here's the, the real, kind of the, I don't know, side note to this, but a serious dilemma is that we can look at this idea and think, well, I want to have a great prayer life, but I don't pray, so therefore... And we start feeling guilty, or I'm going to pray because why? I'm supposed to pray. Oh, I'm supposed to pray. Be very careful of that. Uh, I think it was Alan Redpath that said, if you want to make anyone feel guilty, ask them about their prayer life. <laughs> How are you doing? Uh, not great. Yeah. But and we, we tend to compare ourselves to Elijah, and these people are in church, so they must be praying too. And we're probably thinking about each other. Let's just pray. And let's just spend time with the Lord. Of course, Elijah's prayers were, were heard and answered because he prayed them. I think the Lord wants us to have the prayer life of Elijah. This, this great idea of, okay, I want to have this patience of a farmer, hardworking farmer. That's great. I can get that. Endurance of Job. But, well, you don't know the, the difficult things that I'm going through right now in my life. I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can press on like that. Well, you know what? I mean, Job, that's great. Farmer, that's great. Elijah, that's great. But Jesus endured. He endured to the point of death. The death on the cross for our sake. He went through that for us. That He might give us eternal life. And how? Freely. So do we find ourselves praying because we're supposed to? Or because we say, wow, Lord, if you did that for me, I just want to spend time with you. I want to talk to you. I want to deepen my relationship with you. I want to get to know you better. Makes it a lot easier to pray, doesn't it? We're kind of keeping tabs on, eh, I've only been praying for three minutes. I really wanted to get four today. <laughs> Whatever that might be. And some of you are like, wow, he prays four minutes. <laughs> wow, that's a, he's a great prayer life. I, but whatever it is, be very careful that it doesn't become some sort of legalism that I must pray such and such amount of time. Because here's the thing, and I heard someone describe it like this. You find yourself getting into what's known as the more syndrome. Because could you be praying more? Yeah. Are you praying an hour a day? Okay, 45 minutes. Could you be praying more? Yeah. Pretty soon, well, I'm praying five hours a day. Could you be praying more? Well, I guess so. And when does it, when does it stop? Or could you be reading your Bible more? Well, yeah. Four minutes of Bible reading? 45 minutes of Bible reading? Four hours of Bible reading? Well, because I need to, wait a minute. If Jesus took away my sins and freely gave me eternal life and wants a relationship with Him, then He wants just that, a relationship. And the best way to work on a relationship with anyone is to talk with them. So to have this prayer life like Elijah did, it just involves me talking to my Savior. I read the Word because I want to hear His heart for me. So as we you know, go out today, I, I want to be careful that, that we're not thinking of all these great examples in the Scriptures and thinking, well, I'll never be like that. Why not? 
why can't I have a prayer life with someone like Elijah, who was a man with a nature like mine and yours? He prayed. He prayed earnestly and things happened. Let's pray. Lord God, we do thank you for these examples in your word. And Lord, we want to be men and women that are patient, that are patient with one another, but Lord, that we're patient with the work that you set before us to do, to pray for our family, our friends, our neighbors, to invite them to church, to invite them to these types of events, the Harvest America. We want to be patient with that. We want to have that same confidence that the farmer did, knowing that you're going to do something. And Lord, we want to endure. Father, I pray for anyone today in their Christian life, they're either slowing down or finding, them saying, finding themselves saying, I, I think I want to quit. It's too much. I'm too tired. I can't go on. Lord, would you help them? Lord, would you fill all of us with your spirit that we might continue? But for those, Lord, that are finding themselves wanting to quit, would you give them that extra measure of grace, that extra measure of strength to do what you set before them to do? And Lord, even this, what we're doing right now, speaking with you, may you work in our hearts by your spirit a greater desire to pray, not obligatory prayer that I must do this or I need to do more, but God, I just want to spend time with you. And Lord, as that happens with your people, with this church, would we see great things happen? Would we see you move in great ways? Would we find great, bold prayers being answered? And Lord, the simplest of prayers also being answered. As we move through this life, Lord, may we look to you for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen.